Chapter 7 of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Lucas. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gold. Chapter 7 William Tell. I suppose that most people regard William Tell, the hero of Switzerland, as an historical character, and visit the scenes made memorable by his exploits with corresponding interest when they undertake the regular Swiss round. It is one of the painful duties of the antiquarian to dispel many a popular belief and to probe the groundlessness of many an historical statement. The antiquarian is sometimes disposed to ask with Pilate, what is truth? when he finds historical facts crumbling beneath his touch into mythical fables, and he soon learns to doubt and question the most emphatic declarations of, and claims to, reliability. Sir Walter Raleigh, in his prison, was composing the second volume of his History of the World. Leaning on the sill of his window, he meditated on the duties of the historian to mankind, when suddenly his attention was attracted by a disturbance in the courtyard before his cell. He saw one man strike another, whom he supposed by his dress to be an officer. The latter at once drew his sword and ran the former through the body. The wounded man felled his adversary with a stick and then sank upon the pavement. At this juncture the guard came up and carried off the officer insensible, and then the corpse of the man who had been run through. Next day Raleigh was visited by an intimate friend, to whom he related the circumstances of the quarrel and its issue. To his astonishment, his friend unhesitatingly declared that the prisoner had mistaken the whole series of incidents which had passed before his eyes. The supposed officer was not an officer at all, but the servant of a foreign ambassador. It was he who had dealt the first blow. He had not drawn his sword, but the other had snatched it from his side and had run him through the body before anyone could interfere. Whereupon a stranger from among the crowd knocked the murderer down with his stick, and some of the foreigners belonging to the ambassador's retinue carried off the corpse. The friend of Raleigh added that government had ordered the arrest and immediate trial of the murderer, as the man assassinated was one of the principal servants of the Spanish ambassador. "'Excuse me,' said Raleigh, "'but I cannot have been deceived as you suppose, for I was eyewitness to the events which took place under my own window.' and the man fell there on that spot where you see a paving stone standing up above the rest. My dear Raleigh, replied his friend, I was sitting on that stone when the fray took place, and I received this slight scratch on my cheek in snatching the sword from the murderer, and upon my word of honor you have been deceived upon every particular. Sir Walter, when alone, took up the second volume of his history, which was in manuscript, and contemplating it, thought, if I cannot believe my own eyes, how can I be assured of the truth of a tithe of the events which happened ages before I was born, and he flung the manuscript into the fire? Now I think that I can show that the story of William Tell is as fabulous as, what shall I say, any other historical event. It is almost too well known to need repetition. In the year 1307, Gessler, vogged of Emperor Albert of Habsburg, set a hat on a pole, as symbol of imperial power, and ordered everyone who passed by to do obeisance towards it. A mountaineer of the name of Tell boldly traversed the space before it without saluting the abhorred symbol. By Gessler's command, he was at once seized and brought before him. As Tell was known to be an expert archer, he was ordered, by way of punishment, to shoot an apple off the head of his own son. Finding remonstrance vain, he submitted. The apple was placed on the child's head. Tell bent his bow, the arrow sped, and apple and arrow fell together to the ground. But the Vogts noticed that Tell, before shooting, had stuck another arrow into his belt, and he inquired the reason. It was for you, replied the sturdy archer. Had I shot my child, know that I would have not missed your heart. This event, observe, took place in the beginning of the 14th century. But Saxo Grammaticus, a Danish writer of the 12th century, tells the story of a hero of his own country, who lived in the 10th century. He relates the incident in horrible style as follows. Nor ought what follows to be enveloped in silence. Toki, 
who had for some time been in the king's service, had by his deeds surpassing those of his comrades made enemies of his virtues. One day, when he had drunk too much, he boasted to those who sat at a table with him that his skill in archery was such that with the first shot of an arrow he could hit the smallest apple set on top of a stick at a considerable distance. His detractors, hearing this, lost no time in conveying what he had said to the king, Harold Bluetooth. But the wickedness of this monarch soon transformed the confidence of the father to the jeopardy of the son, for he ordered the dearest pledge of his life to stand in place of the stick, for whom, if the utterer of the boast did not at his first shot strike down the arrow, he should with his head pay the penalty of having made an idle boast. The command of the king urged the soldier to do this, which was so much more than he had undertaken, the detracting artifices of the others having taken advantage of words spoken when he was hardly sober. As soon as the boy was led forth, Toki carefully admonished him to receive the whir of the arrow as calmly as possible, with attentive ears and without moving his head, lest by a slight motion of the body he should frustrate the experience of his well-tried skill. He also made him stand with his back towards him, lest he should be frightened at the sight of the arrow. Then he drew three arrows from his quiver, and the very first he shot struck the proposed mark. Toki, being asked by the king why he had taken so many arrows out of his quiver, when he was to make but one trial with his bow, that I might avenge on thee, he replied, the error of the first by the points of the others, lest my innocence might happen to be afflicted and thy injustice go unpunished. The same incident is told of Agil, brother of the mythical Velund, in the saga of Thydric. In Norwegian history also it appears with variations again and again. It is told of King Olaf the Saint, that desiring the conversion of a brave heathen named Eindridi, he competed with him in various athletic sports. He swam with him, wrestled, and then shot with him. The king dared Eindridi to strike a writing tablet from off his son's head with an arrow, Eindridi prepared to attempt the difficult shot. The king bade two men bind the eyes of the child and hold the napkin so that he might not move when he heard the whistle of the arrow. The king aimed first, and the arrow grazed the lad's head. Eindridi then prepared to shoot, but the mother of the boy interfered and persuaded the king to abandon this dangerous test of skill. In this version also, Eindridi is prepared to revenge himself on the king should the child be injured. But a closer approximation still to the Tell myth is found in the life of Hemming, another Norse archer who was challenged by King Harald, Sigurd's son. The story is thus told. The island was densely overgrown with wood, and the people went into the forest. The king took a spear and set it with its point in the soil. Then he laid an arrow on the string and shot it up into the air. The arrow turned in the air, came down upon the spear shaft, and stood upon it. Hemming took another arrow and shot it up. His was lost to sight for some while, but it came back and pierced the nick of the king's arrow. Then the king took a knife and stuck it into an oak. He next drew his bow and planted an arrow in the haft of the knife. Thereupon Hemming took his arrows. The king stood by him and said, They are all inlaid with gold. You are a capital workman. Hemming answered, They are not my manufacture, but our presents. He shot, and his arrow cleft the half, and the point entered the socket of the blade. We must have a keener contest, said the king, taking an arrow and flushing with anger. Then he laid the arrow on the string and drew his bow to the farthest, so that the horns were nearly brought to meet. Away flashed the arrow and pierced a tender twig. All said that this was a most astonishing feat of dexterity. But Hemming shot from a greater distance and split a hazelnut. All were astonished to see this. Then, said the king, take a nut and set it on the head of your brother Bjorn, and aim it from precisely the same distance. If you miss the mark, then your life goes. Hemming answered, Sir, my life is at your disposal, but I would not adventure that shot. Then out spake Bjorn, Shoot, brother, rather than die yourself. Hemming said, Have you the pluck to stand quite still without shrinking? I will do my best, said Bjorn. Then let the king stand by, said Hemming, and let him see whether I touch the nut. The king agreed and bade Ode Eufig's son stand by Bjorn and see that the shot was fair. Hemming then went to the spot fixed for him by the king and signed himself with the cross, saying, God be my witness that I had rather die myself than injure my brother Bjorn. Let all the blame rest on King Harold. Then Hemming flung his spear. The spear went straight to the mark, 
and passed between the nut and the crown of the lad, who was not in the least injured. It flew farther and stopped not till it fell. Then the king came up and asked Ode what he thought about the shot. Years after, this risk was revenged on the hard-hearted monarch. In the Battle of Stamford Bridge, an arrow from a skilled archer penetrated the windpipe of the king, and it is supposed to have sped, observes the saga writer, from the bow of Hemming, then in the service of the English monarch. The story is related somewhat differently in the Faroe Islands as is told of Gady, Aslak's son. The same herald asks his men if they know who is his match in strength. Yes, they reply, there is a peasant's son in the uplands, Gady, son of Aslak, who is the strongest of men. Forth goes the king, and at last rides up to the house of Aslak. And where is your son? Alas, alas, he lies under the green sod of Corin Kirkgarth. Come then and show me his corpse, old man, that I may judge whether he was as stout of limb as men say. The father puts the king off, with the excuse that among so many dead it would be hard to find his boy. So the king rides away over the heath. He meets a stately man returning from the chase with a bow over his shoulder. And who art thou, friend? Gady, Aslak's son, the dead man in short, alive and well. The king tells him he had heard of his prowess, and has come to match his strength with him. So Gady and the king try a swimming match. The king swims well, but Gady swims better, and in the end gives the monarch such a ducking that he is borne to his house devoid of sense and motion. Harold swallows his anger as he had swallowed the water, and bids Gady shoot a hazelnut from off his brother's head. Aslak's son consents, and invites the king into the forest to witness his dexterity. On the string the shaft he laid, and God hath heard his prayer. He shot the little nut away, not hurt the lad a hair. Next day the king sends for the skillful bowman. List thee, Gaty, Aslak's son, and truly tell to me. Wherefore hast thou arrows twain in the woods yestreen with thee? The bowman replies, Therefore had I arrows twain yestreen in the wood with me. Had I but hurt my brother dear, the other had pierced thee. A very similar tale is told also in the celebrated Malleus Maleficarum of a man named Puncher, with this difference, that a coin is placed on the lad's head instead of an apple or a nut. The person who had dared Puncher to the test of skill inquires the use of the second arrow in his belt and receives the usual answer, that if the first arrow had missed the coin, the second would have transfixed a certain heart, which was destitute of natural feeling. We have, moreover, our English version of the same story in the venerable ballad of William of Cloudsley. The Finn ethnologist Castron obtained the following tale in the Finnish village of Utwa. A fight took place between some freebooters and the inhabitants of the village of Alajawi. The robbers plundered every house and carried off amongst their captives an old man. As they proceeded with their spoils along the strand of the lake, a lad of twelve years old appeared from among the reeds on the opposite bank. Armed with a bow and amply provided with arrows, he threatened to shoot down the captors unless the old man his father were restored to him. The robbers mockingly replied that the aged man would be given to him if he could shoot an apple off his head. The boy accepted the challenge, and on successfully accomplishing it, the surrender of the venerable captive was made. Farid Udin Attar was a Persian dealer in perfumes born in the year 1119. He one day was so impressed with the sight of a dervish that he sold his possessions and followed righteousness. He composed the poem Mantic Uter, or the language of birds, observed the Persian Attar, lived at the same time as the Danish Saxo, and long before the birth of Tell. Curiously enough, we find a trace of the Tell myth in the pages of his poem. According to him, however, the king shoots the apple from the head of a beloved page, and the lad dies from sheer fright, though the arrow does not even graze his skin. The coincidence of finding so many versions of the same story scattered through countries as remote as Persia and Iceland, Switzerland and Denmark proves, I think, that it can in no way be regarded as history, but is rather one of the numerous household myths common to the whole stock of Aryan nations, probably some one more acquainted with Sanskrit literature than myself and with better access to its unpublished stores of fable and legend, will some day light on an early Indian tale corresponding to that so prevalent among other branches of the same family. The coincidence of the Tell myth being discovered among the Finns is attributable to Russian or Swedish influence. 
I do not regard it as a primeval Turanian, but as an Aryan story, which, like an erratic block, is found deposited on foreign soil far from the mountain whence it was torn. German mythologists, I suppose, consider the myth to represent the manifestation of some natural phenomena, and the individuals of the story to be impersonifications of natural forces. Most primeval stories were thus constructed, and their origin is traceable enough. In Thorn Rose, for instance, who can fail to see the earth goddess represented by the sleeping beauty in her long winter slumber, only returning to life when kissed by the golden-haired sun god Phoebus or Baldur? But the tell myth has not its signification thus painted on the surface, and those who suppose Gessler or Harold to be the power of evil and darkness, the bold archer to be the storm cloud with his arrow of lightning and his iris bow, bent against the sun which is resting like a coin or a golden apple on the edge of the horizon are overstraining their theories and exacting too much from our credulity. In these pages and elsewhere I have shown how some of the ancient myths related by the whole Aryan family of nations are reducible to allegorical explanations of certain well-known natural phenomena. But I must protest against the manner in which our German friends fasten rapaciously upon every atom of history, sacred and profane, and demonstrate all heroes to represent the sun, all villains to be the demons of night or winter, all sticks and spears and arrows to be the lightning, all cows and sheep and dragons and swans to be clouds. In the work on the superstition of werewolves, I have entered into this subject with some fullness, and am quite prepared to admit the premises upon which mythologists construct their theories. At the same time, I am not disposed to run to the extravagant links reached by some of the enthusiastic German scholars. A wholesome warning to those gentlemen was given some years ago by an ingenious French ecclesiastic who wrote the following argument to prove that Napoleon Bonaparte was a mythological character. Archbishop Waitley's historic doubts was grounded on a totally different line of argument. I subjoin the other as a curiosity and as a caution. Napoleon is, says the writer, an impersonification of the sun. 1. Between the name Napoleon and Apollo, or Apollyon, the god of the sun, there is but a trifling difference. Indeed, the seeming difference is lessened if we take the spelling of his name from the column of the place Vendome where it stands Neapolio, but this syllable, Ne, prefixed to the name of the sun god, is of importance. Like the rest of the name, it is of Greek origin, and is Ne, or Nai, a particle of affirmation, as though indicating Napoleon as the very true Apollo, or sun. His other name, Bonaparte, makes this apparent connection between the French hero and the luminary of the firmament conclusively certain. The day has its two parts, the good and the luminous portion, and that which is bad and dark. To the sun belongs the good part, to the moon and stars belongs the bad portion. It is therefore natural that Apollo, or Napoleon, should receive the surname Bonaparte. 2. Apollo was born in Delos, a Mediterranean island, Napoleon in Corsica, an island in the same sea. According to Pausanias, Apollo was an Egyptian deity, and in the mythological history of the fabulous Napoleon, we find the hero in Egypt, regarded by the inhabitants with veneration and receiving their homage. 3. The mother of Napoleon was said to be Letitia, which signifies joy, and is an impersonification of the dawn of light, dispensing joy and gladness to all creation. Letitia is no other than the break of day, which in a manner brings the sun into the world, and, with rosy fingers, opes the gates of day. It is significant that the Greek name for the mother of Apollo was Leto. From this, the Romans made the name Latona, which they gave to his mother. But Laeto is the unused form of the verb Laetor, and signified to inspire joy. It is from this unused form that the substantive Letitia is derived. The identity, then, of the mother of Napoleon with the Greek Leto and Latin Latona is established conclusively. 4. According to the popular story, this son of Letitia had three sisters, and was it not the same with the Greek deity who had three graces? 5. The modern Gaelic Apollo had four brothers. It is impossible not to discern here the anthropomorphosis of the four seasons, but it will be objected the seasons should be females. Here the French language interposes, for in French the seasons are masculine, with the exception of autumn upon the gender of which grammarians are undecided. 
whilst autumnus in latin is not more feminine than the other seasons this difficulty is therefore trifling and what follows removes all shadow of doubt of the four brothers of napoleon three are said to have been kings and these of course are spring reigning over the flowers summer reigning over the harvest autumn holding sway over the fruits and as these three seasons owe all to the powerful influence of the sun we are told in the popular myth that the three brothers of napoleon drew their authority from him and received from him their kingdoms but if it be added that of the four brothers of napoleon one was not a king that was because he is the impersonification of winter which has no reign over anything if however it be asserted in contradiction that the winter has an empire he will be given the principality over snows and frosts which in the dreary season of the year whiten the face of the earth well the fourth brother of napoleon is thus invested by popular tradition commonly called history with a vain principality accorded to him in the decline of the power of napoleon the principality was that of canino a name derived from cani or the whitened hairs of a frozen old age a true emblem of winter to the eyes of poets the forests covering the hills are their hair and when winter frosts them they represent the snowy locks of a decrepit nature in the old age of the year cum gelidus crescit canis in montibus humor consequently the prince of canino is an impersonification of winter winter whose reign begins when the kingdoms of three fine seasons are passed from them and when the sun is driven from his power by the children of the north as the poets call the boreal winds this is the origin of the fabulous invasion of france by the allied armies of the north the story relates that these invaders the northern gales banished the many-colored flag and replaced it by a white standard this too is a graceful but at the same time purely fabulous account of the northern winds driving all the brilliant colors from the face of the soil to replace them by the snowy sheet six napoleon is said to have had two wives it is well known that the classic fable gave two also to apollo these two were the moon and the earth plutarch asserts that the greeks gave the moon to apollo for wife whilst the egyptians attributed to him the earth by the moon he had no posterity but by the other he had one son only the little horus this is an egyptian allegory representing the fruits of agriculture produced by the earth fertilized by the sun the pretended son of the fabulous napoleon is said to have been born on the twentieth of march the season of the spring equinox when agriculture is assuming its greatest period of activity seven napoleon is said to have released france from the devastating scourge which terrorized over the country the hydra of the revolution as it was popularly called who cannot see in this a gaelic version of the greek legend of apollo releasing hellas from the terrible python the very name revolution derived from the latin verb revolvo is indicative of the coils of a serpent like the python eight the famous hero of the nineteenth century had it is asserted twelve marshals at the head of his armies and four who were stationary and inactive the twelve first as may be seen at once are the signs of the zodiac marching under the orders of the sun napoleon and each commanding a division of the innumerable host of stars which are parted into twelve portions corresponding to the twelve signs as for the four stationary officers immovable in the midst of general motion they are the cardinal points nine it is currently reported that the chief of these brilliant armies after having gloriously traversed the southern kingdoms penetrated north and was there unable to maintain his sway this too represents the course of the sun which assumes its greatest power in the south but after the spring equinox seeks to reach the north and after three months march towards the boreal regions is driven back upon his traces following the sign of cancer a sign given to represent the retrogression of the sun in that portion of the sphere it is on this that the story of the march of napoleon towards moscow and his humbling retreat is founded ten finally the sun rises in the east and sets in the western sea the poets picture him rising out of the waters in the east and setting in the ocean after his twelve hours reign in the sky such is the history of napoleon coming from his mediterranean isle holding the reins of government for twelve years and finally disappearing in the mysterious regions of the great atlantic to those who see in samson the image of the sun the correlative of the classic hercules this clever skit of the accomplished french abbe may prove as value as a caution 
End of chapter 7. Recording by Timothy Lucas.